Good morning, I'm Melissa Harris-Perry. It was hard to ignore the three most notable items in the news this week. No, I'm not talking about Benghazi, the Justice Department subpoenas, and the IRS Tea Party targeting. I am talking about Angelina Jolie and her left and right breasts. She and they were everywhere after we woke up to a Tuesday morning New York Times editorial from Jolie about her difficult decision to undergo a prophylactic double mastectomy to reduce her likelihood of developing breast cancer. Now, Jolie knew exactly the odds she was facing after the results of a genetic test revealed that she had an 87% risk of developing breast cancer and a 50% risk of getting the hereditary ovarian cancer that killed her mother at age 56. Jolie's test came back positive for a mutation on a gene known as BRCA1, or BRCA1. Uh, BRCA1 the, and another gene called BRCA2 are tumor suppressors that work by preventing uncontrolled growth of cells. Mutations on these genes, like the one found in Jolie's test, exponentially increase breast cancer risk. A woman who has inherited the flaw in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes is about five times more likely to develop breast cancer than a woman without the mutation. Now, it is a terrifying possibility to consider both for women who've tested positive and for women who haven't taken the test but fear what may be lurking in their DNA. Jolie said she was motivated to share her story by a desire to help women face that fear through empowering themselves with information. She wrote, quote, I chose not to keep my story private because there are many women who do not know that they may be living under the shadow of cancer. It is my hope that they, too, will be able to get gene tested and that if they have a high risk, they, too, will know they have strong options. Only women who carry genes with the BRCA mutation aren't the only beneficiaries of the test. So too is the company that owns the exclusive rights to their genes. Myriad Genetics, a Salt Lake City biotech company, has owned the patent on BRCA1 since 1997 and BRCA2 since 1998. Oh, you thought your body belonged to you? Think again. Because every copy of each BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene in every cell of my body and yours belongs to a private company. So does all the information those genes may be able to tell us about our health. And while those genes are just hanging out inside your cells, doing what genes do, they are busy making Myriad Genetics a lot of money. The patents give the company the sole right to BRCA analysis, the, the, the Angelina Jolie test, and along with an estimated one million people have decided to take it in the past decade since Myriad was first awarded the patents. And with no competition, Myriad is free to set a single price for women who want to find out if they have the mutation. Any woman wanting to take the test should be prepared to shell out $3,000. Now, the Affordable Care Act will allow patients to take the test at no cost as part of coverage for preventative care, but that's only for non-grandfathered plans. In other words, those that existed after March 23rd, 2010. Grandfathered plans in place before that date are exempt from the ACA requirements for preventative coverage without cost sharing. Meanwhile, all of those tests add up to half a billion dollars each year in revenue for Myriad Genetics. The company's stock jumped up to a three-year high after Jolie's editorial on Tuesday. And that's just one company profiting from two genes. In the decades since the Human Genome Project mapped the 25,000 genes that make us who we are, more than 4,000 of them have been snatched up and patented. That's nearly 20% of the genome, 4,000 tiny pieces of ourselves that are not fully ours. Myriad's monopoly landed the company in the Supreme Court last month where the justices took up this essential question of whether a private company can claim ownership of something that is a product of nature, in this case, the building blocks of our very being. The answer for now at least is yes. Myriad is still the only game in town for women who want to follow Jolie's advice and take the test. But perhaps as we consider the unsettling understanding that our bodies are not wholly our own, there is something else instructive in Jolie's example about the integrity of our bodies. In Jolie, we see a woman who makes a living in large part due to the appearance of her physical body, making the choice to lose precious parts of it, but still remaining fully whole.
Joining me now, Dr. Monica Peake, Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago, also founder and executive director of Women's Health Advocacy Group, Sisters Working It Out. She's also a breast cancer survivor herself. Rose Ellen Lessie, Assistant Professor at the New School. Also, Erin Carmone, staff writer for Salon.com, and Valerie Kaur, director of Groundswells and a political commentator and a senior fellow at Auburn Seminary. Thanks to all of you for being here. Hey, thanks for having us. Doctor, I want to start with you. Help me to understand a little bit exactly what the BRCA gene is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's obviously been in the news because of Angelina Jolie. Right. What do people need to know about it? Well, it's something that is not a routine test that's available for all women. So when we think about population-based um, breast cancer screening, it's very uncommon. 90% of the women who have breast cancer do not have any sort of inherited mutation. So we should not think that this is going to be a routine test like we do for diabetes mm-hmm. or for high cholesterol. So we should not expect that everyone should be um, wanting to have a BRCA gene mutation uh, test for that. Of the muta- genetic mutations that we know exist, BRCA1 and 2 are the most common. Mm-hmm. Um, certain racial and ethnic groups tend to be more likely to have them. African Americans so far are not. Ashkenazi mm-hmm. Jewish women are. We know that when you have the gene, like you had said, the increased risk of both breast and ovarian cancer is much higher than the average population. But again, these genes are very uncommon. Mm-hmm. And so it really is um, incumbent for women to know their own personal history mm-hmm. and their family's history and to work with the genetic counselor to figure out in really who is at risk for that gene. What normally happens is the person who's diagnosed with breast cancer is the one who gets tested, not right. the family members. So if you have a family member who has ovarian cancer or breast cancer and they're still living, they're the ones who need to get tested for the BRCA gene. Mm. If they don't have it, it's not in your family. But then there's not a reason to think that, it, that it's in your family. So, so Rosalind, I want to go to you in part because you have had this test yourself yes. in part because of your own family history. That's correct. Um, and yet you still see access as a fundamental problem. I do. Um, I feel like a three to four thousand dollar test is, as you said, completely out of reach for anyone who doesn't have quality health care insurance. Um, when I took the test, I did have insurance and it covered most of the test except for, I think it was a hundred and fifty dollar deductible. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a kind of pervasive testing anxiety right mm-hmm. now so that women who perhaps are not actually good candidates to take the test Mm -hmm. might nonetheless feel that they should. Um, And those are women who um, certainly would not get the test covered through their insurance. And this is probably why, I mean, this is why the the stock jumped up, is because all of a sudden you think, particularly if, I mean, there's already enough of a question around mammograms, right? But all of a sudden you hear, oh, there's another test, I I better go out and get that. Right. And my concern is that then uh, Maria Genetics, who has a legal monopoly Mm -hmm. over this test, is going to to unfairly profit Mm -hmm. from sort of stoking the anxiety uh, among women who, again, are not at high risk and don't need to take the test Mm -hmm. um, by sort of making them think that they do need to take the test. And so there's an unfortunate sort of corporate profit to be made from um, stoking anxiety and and perhaps failing to uh, differentiate between who's high risk and who isn't. And and Erin, you wrote about this um, this week in in, in the wake of of Jolie's decision on exactly this question. And it's a tough one. On the the one hand, you know, we we both need to applaud Jolie's personal personal courage, but also the ways in which whenever you have this kind of celebrity endorsement, it allows information to get out that might not otherwise be there. But then there is this issue of, of profit margin and who really most benefits from these tests. So the medical professionals and the ACLU who brought the case in the Supreme Court, the oral arguments were heard in April, specifically made the case that not only does the gene patent limit the kind of research that can happen, it limits the kind of results you can get because it can only go through myriads of laboratories. It means you can't get a second opinion. And the last portion of their argument, their brief, says that this has a disproportionate impact on racial and ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. One, because their genetic uh, variants isn't captured by the existing studies because they were done on very particular populations, and two, because we all know that there is an existing framework of healthcare disparities, this is not in a vacuum. This is going to be governed by the same principles of who has insurance, who has what kind of insurance, who has what trust in the medical system, and as a result, there have been several studies showing that there are significant disparities among who gets the genetic counseling to Mm -hmm. determine whether they should take the test. And I I don't want to miss this point that that you just made, which is you can't, there isn't a second test, there isn't a second opinion. You can take the test again, right? right? But but that is really very different. And that's all because of the nature of the patent. Is there a moral and ethical obligation that we not patent the, the genes? or And how do we sort of put that against, you know, on, on the other hand, the kind of economic 
benefit that comes from when you have a private company that that makes profit, then they do work on this issue. Right. I think this is an opportunity for us to think about how stories can affect social change so that these kinds of benefits can be available to all women. Mm. And we're talking about Angelina's story, not just because she's a celebrity, but because her story is powerful. I mean, it has resonance. Stories can save us. Stories can inspire us to see ourselves differently. Um, and not just women with cancer. One of my dearest friends, um, Joyce, is a uh, uh, someone who is from a low-income background who was diagnosed with multiple myeloma this year. I watched her struggle every day to fight for the health care she needed uh, for a disease that does not get as much attention as breast cancer. For us, you know, among anyone, I thought she would be the one who would be put off by the spotlight on a celebrity. But Joyce was inspired. She mm. said, Angelina looked bravely into the unknown and took action. We women can be the heroes of our own stories. I think our job now at the table is to think about how stories can affect social change, how we can fight for a world where all women like Joyce mm -hmm. have the opportunity to be as courageous as Angelina yep. Jolie, how our healthcare system can work for all, not just those who can afford it. Yeah, when we come back, there is so much more on breast cancer. I want to talk to you, doctor, about mammograms. I want to talk also specifically about things that both of you brought up, which is that kind of um, health disparities and, and what kinds of groups are shut out of this whole story. So more on breast cancer in black and white when we come back.